You're listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn, where you'll find uplifting and practical advice for everyday living, creative inspiration for do-it-yourself projects, and recommendations for books and resources that will encourage you to embrace your life repurposed. I'm your host, Michelle Rayburn. Hi there! This is episode number 10 of Life Repurposed. This week I've decided to title it Procrastinator No More, New Habits That Lead to Success. I think procrastination is something that a lot of us have in common. And even if you uh, wouldn't consider yourself a procrastinator by nature, you probably have put off a project at some point in your life. So I'm talking about this because it's something I'm actually working on myself. I used to be a lot more of a procrastinator and I'm more of an action person now, but I still procrastinate some things. So here's an example. I finished my taxes on Saturday. I have about five weeks before the IRS deadline, but I still need to get mine to my CPA so that they can do their part. And so for me, I put it off as long as I could. And I tend to procrastinate either big projects or things that I really hate. And I don't love getting all my tax stuff gathered together, even when I keep really good records. It's just not fun (laughs) to get it all together and get it to the CPA. So if you're a procrastinator, uh, listen to this definition from James Clear and see if you can resonate with this. Procrastination is the act of delaying or postponing a task or set of tasks. It is the force that prevents you from following through on what you set out to do. Whatever it is you set out to do, it could be something in your personal life, it could be something at work, it could be a health goal or some other achievement, or it could be something really small that you procrastinate. And you'll see that in my um, second section of this podcast and video. So if you want to find out more about what I'm talking about today, I encourage you to go to michellerayburn.com slash 10 and you will get the show notes and that way you can get links to the things that I'm going to be talking about. There will be a lot of content in this episode, but I know it's time to cover it because there's got to be somebody else out there who's walking through this process with me. So procrastination is really an art if you think about it because it is the fine line between crashing and burning in glorious failure and getting something done at just the right time. So that means you have to know how long you can wait to start and how much time you're going to need to do an okay job of something and then still get it done on time without a disaster coming your way. Now, I've discovered that natural things happen sometimes, and so sometimes there's something that um, keeps us from getting something done in a timely way. So right from the start, there's going to be some of you who say, I do my best work under pressure. I just know that about myself. I know that to be true. Well, I used to think that too, and I think it's something that some people are good at for sure, but others of us deceive ourselves because we want to believe that that's true because then we can justify procrastinating and putting something off. And so what I find when we put something off and we do it in the last minute is you get one take on it. So whatever creative ideas you came up with under pressure, that's what you have. That's what you can deliver. And the problem with that is that sometimes those ideas are great and other times you could use a little more brewing to get to the place where that's really finished. And so you miss out on some of your most creative work, the best solutions for that project. Yes, you get it done, but you miss out on the process that comes when you let it do a little bit. So um, for those of you who do come up with great ideas under pressure, that is awesome. Imagine how much even greater you could come up with if you had a little more wiggle room where you could think about it afterwards a little bit. So I think having time to plan ahead on a project, no matter how big it is, gives you that opportunity to schedule some creative thinking time, coming up with some solutions that are even better than your first thoughts. So as we get rolling here, I want to talk about some reasons for why we might procrastinate. And for me, I'm going to share these seven things that I think cause us to procrastinate There are definitely more out there. I've drawn these from my own personal experience, from things other people have told me, and from some of the reading I've done. And none of them are like earth shattering in that I can attribute them to any one person because I think they're common things that we experience. So what I'm going to do is list the seven things and then I'm going to debunk them a little bit with some solutions for how we could get over that and not use those seven reasons as an excuse to not get anything done. So let's look at the seven. Number one, you're overwhelmed and don't know where to begin, so you avoid it altogether. 
Two, you have too many other things going on and truly don't have time. Number three, perfection paralyzes you. Four, you've bought the lie that you work well under pressure. Five, you're waiting for the right mood to strike. Six, you're percolating. You'd rather think about it for a while and brew some ideas. And seven, you're putting out fires all day because of what seems urgent, but you can't get to what is important. So why does it matter to understand the why? Well, if you don't know why you do something, you can't figure out how to fix it. So knowing the why helps you discover the how. I think that's important to remember. Knowing the why helps you discover the how. So I want you to look at why you tend to put off certain types of things. And if you've never procrastinated anything, that's really awesome. I'd like to hear from you because I want to know how you have gotten through life without ever putting off something big (laughs) or little. Okay, so knowing the why helps you discover the how. So those who never figure out how to set goals and achieve them will forever watch others pass them by. And they're going to start thinking that life is for everyone else. And I've met some of you, and I know that this is how some people feel, that life has passed them by, that the opportunities are for other people, other people finish their books, other people get to launch the dream, do the thing they've always wanted to do, other people get promotions at work, other people accomplish stuff. And I've talked about accomplishment, I've talked about goals, but procrastination is the one thing that I think stops some people from seizing what they already have. So they don't realize that life didn't pass them by and they didn't miss it. You know, it's like if you're playing a game and you gotta run to the bathroom and then you start fixing your hair and you're messing around and then you realize, oh yeah, the the rest of my team's waiting out there to finish the card game or the dominoes or whatever you're playing. Um, It's kind of like that, where we've stepped aside and we're goofing around on things that don't really matter, and we, we don't realize that it hasn't passed us by. Our turn is sitting right there waiting for us. So your turn is waiting for you. Life didn't pass you by and run away. The dream or whatever it is you have there, or whatever it is you've put off, is still right where you left it, and it's waiting for you to pick it up and run with it. So let's take a look at um, how we can debunk some of these myths or the things that cause us to procrastinate and also think a little bit about guilt. If you feel guilty for having stopped your progress and you're sitting still, just wipe it away and let this be your reset moment because if you spend more time feeling guilty about the fact that you haven't acted, then you're actually procrastinating some more. So I want you to Just wipe it away, let the guilt go, and say, from this day forward, I'm going to make a change, and here are some solutions. So let's look at the first one that I said there. The first reason we procrastinate. You're overwhelmed and don't know where to begin, so you avoid it altogether. Even if you can't do the whole project right now, I encourage you to survey what needs to be done and then break it into smaller tasks that you can assign to yourself. It will also help you to have a real picture of when you can meet a deadline. So I'll be talking about some resources in the final section of this episode, and I'll be mentioning James Clear, who's an expert on productivity. But um, I want to just mention a couple of things that he says on his blog and in his books. He talks about planning the night before for the tasks you will do the next day. I have found that this works for me because before I close up my office for the night and walk down the hall and into the kitchen, because I don't have to commute, I work from home, before I do that, often I will determine what the first thing is that I'm going to do the next day. I don't have the whole day even planned out, but I will determine something. And if I can get started on that before anything else in the day, I feel very productive and it helps me to not procrastinate. So I'll talk about that in point number seven a little bit more and we get to the seventh point in this list. But the other thing that has worked for me is using Trello, and I will have a link in the show notes at michellerayburn.com slash 10, so you can um, check out Trello if you want. I create project boards in there, and I will take a project and break it down into steps and then do little punch lists because you can do little check boxes. And so I'll make these punch lists that I'm going to go through with a project. And then you can even, if you get really geeky with it, schedule and, and assign dates and deadlines and everything in there. But what I do is I go through that list then, and it helps me to finish a project, but I don't have to look at it as like this big 
thing. So let's say I have um, build a website as a project. Let's say you're starting a website and you just keep seeing build my website on your to-do list, build my website, create my website. You need to break that down into steps like get my domain name, purchase my hosting, write some content. You see what I'm saying? You need to have little steps. And then like one day is going to be just getting the domain set up. Another one might be writing one page of content, gathering photos. And so one by one, I check off that list and it takes something that I would normally procrastinate that's way overwhelming and makes it something I can do um, bite-sized. And then I block time in my calendar for those specific tasks. I have um, my iPhone calendar and I just actually block out time, schedule it in there. And if I do that at the beginning of the month for my work and my client work, then I know where I have gaps in the day where I can go to lunch or get my nails done. So don't judge me. That's what I do. I build that into my day. So I know where I have room to play when I have all my work scheduled. So one more thing on this also I want to tell you about Michael Hyatt, who is another person who says he plans out the night before what he's going to accomplish the next day. And I'll have a link to Michael Hyatt's blog because he has all kinds of info there. So if you go to my website and look at the blog post that goes along with this, I will definitely give you those links. I've mentioned Michael Hyatt's books before on the Life Repurpose podcast. And so I just want to remind you that um, there are a lot of professionals out there who have some great tips on how to break tasks down so that we can wipe out the excuse of the overwhelm. Okay, that was a lot of time for the very first point, but let's get to number two. Number two, the excuse is you, I have too many other things going on and I truly don't have time. Yeah, this is a problem for a lot of us. It's a bigger problem than just getting one thing done. This is a problem where something has to give. And I know it, and I've had to wipe some fun things out of my schedule, some really great things. Um, but I know that I have to leave room for the things that are important. My pastor recently said in a sermon, we have to cut the good stuff so the better stuff and the best stuff can grow. He was talking about an example of how he had to prune his orange tree. And in pruning fruit trees and bushes, we have to sometimes cut out good branches in order to leave room for the sunlight and everything that the rest of the branches need. And so for me in my life, if I'm procrastinating because I just don't have room to even do the projects that need to get done, I have to take a look at the opportunities I have and decide what do I need to say no to. And I, I don't have any scientific numbers to back it up, but I know that we all need downtime. And if you don't have it, you're more likely to be a procrastinator because your brain is just tired. I don't even need science to back that up. We just get tired and we can't get the stuff done. So um, the other thing is whatever you do, I'm not suggesting multitasking because there are studies out there that prove that multitasking is not the solution for getting anything done or for solving procrastinating. So um, just to know that possibly you need to eliminate some stuff from your schedule in order to be able to get to the things that you've been putting off for a while. Number three excuse is perfectionism paralyzes. I'm gonna get real on this one because this was me for a long time. You see, when I'm forced to do something under pressure, I live on this adrenaline high. And when I have an adrenaline high, I'm optimistic and I'm pressing forward. And I know that I'm going to get this job done. And I have all these creative ideas when I'm under the adrenaline rush. And I'm so excited about it. But in the back of my mind, I'm blocking out that I know that every time I have an adrenaline rush, there's going to be a crash and I'm going to be ornery and people around me are not going to love me at the end of it. So I know this is not the way to work. Here's why we do it if we're perfectionists. In the twisted mind of a perfectionist, we think that waiting until the last minute and crunching it in gives us an excuse. And the excuse we need is, I couldn't do it quite perfect. It's good enough. So if I'm under a time crunch, I can say, well, if I had more time, I would have made it prettier. If I, well, you know, considering the time I had, this is the best I could do. And so we can actually reach a point where we say it's good enough because it's due and I have to turn it in, whether it's for me or a client or you're writing a book or you're doing something at work, whatever it is, 
we crunch it and then we live on the adrenaline and then turn it in and it's good enough. Now, here's my challenge. What if you could get to a place where any time in life you could just say, it's good enough? What if you could do it ahead of time and you could push and use your creativity, but then still get to a place where you say, okay, it's good enough. I'm going to let go of having it perfect. I don't need the excuse of procrastinating in order to give myself permission to say it's good. So I've worked on this and it has helped me so much because when I can get things done ahead of time, before they're due, I have a lot more energy and I'm a lot nicer to my family and the people around me. I'm much more kind. So I encourage you to not use perfectionism as a way to paralyze yourself until you have to get something done. Number four, excuse. You've bought the lie that you work well under pressure. Okay, I talked about this a little bit before, that we think we work well under pressure. Um, I I don't think so. I think there are a handful of people that do, and I think the rest just want to believe that because that's how we work. So what I've done to combat this a little bit is to set artificial deadlines. If you like pressure, make a deadline that is before the real one. I know you're going to say, okay, yeah, I know. It's kind of like setting my clock ahead. I know it's ahead. It's true, but if I have enough projects going and I put a lot of dates in my calendar and I'm going to follow those dates, eventually I'm not exactly sure if that was the real deadline or if it was the one I imposed on myself. And so it actually helps me to stay on track because I just look at the calendar and I say, okay, I've got to have that thing done by that day. And then if it's starting to get close and I'm running out of time, I can look in my notes in Trello, like I said, and I can go, oh, okay, yeah, it's actually, I gave myself a few more days on that, which is a relief because Um, Sometimes there are acts of God that come up, like you get really sick and you can't finish a project or something like that, or, or a loved one gets sick and you need to be a caretaker. So by putting artificial deadlines, you get the adrenaline and yet you get a little bit of cushion. So um, I encourage you to try that if that's you and convince yourself those are the real deadlines. Number five, the excuse we use, you're waiting for the right mood to strike. Oh, as a writer, I used to operate under this a lot where I just needed the right mood to be able to work on a book. And I discovered that it never gets done if I'm waiting for the right mood because it strikes once or twice a year, the actual right mood. And then I write a chapter or two and then it's gone and then it just doesn't get done. And so I've figured out that I have to build in some things that create a mood and it motivates me after I get rolling. So here is an example. Let's say I love a certain show and a new season just came out and I'm subscribing to Netflix or Amazon Prime Video or something like that and this new season is sitting there. I could procrastinate and use the TV watching as a way of not getting anything done Or I could tell myself I'm going to get this project done and motivate myself with the reward of binge watching for a whole Saturday after I finish this. Now that sounds kind of fun and it's guilt free because the project is done. If I do it beforehand, then there's that whole beating up myself of, oh, I watch TV all day and I still have this project that I need to get done. Okay, so um, it's really important then that you create some kind of reward that makes you have a mood that says, okay, I can get this done. The other thing that I love are, and I have one, um, let me grab it. Hey, I'm going to pop off camera a second. I'm in my office and I love these wood wick candles. The wick is actually made out of like some kind of balsa wood. So one of the things I like to do to set mood is um, I'll get my office feeling a certain way because I think, okay, this is going to be in my writing mood. So I write, I light the candle and they crackle when they burn, which is why I like them. I'm sort of obsessed with them. I'll link to them in the show notes if you want to find them. Um, So they crackle like you have a little fireplace going. And then I might brew myself a mocha espresso or something like that and head to my office and say, okay, I'm going to have a writing retreat day in my own office. And I'm standing in my office right now. 
And so um, this is my space. This is where I do my work. I have two desks. I have a table. I have it decorated the way I want to. And so I've created a mood where I feel like I can write. Or That's my main project that I need to do. Um, the other thing that I like to do is maybe go to a coffee shop because I find that the atmosphere there is kind of fun. And so that helps me to create a different kind of a mood too. So whatever it is, if you're waiting for the mood to strike, you have to create it. And if it's not there, start. And I have found that when I start, it might take me a while to get rolling, like I don't have the ideas right away. And the first stuff I write might be icky. It might be like, oh, this is trash and I need to throw it away. But eventually the good stuff comes. So um, create the mood instead of waiting for it to strike. Number six, the excuse is you're percolating. You'd rather think about it for a while and brew some ideas, but you don't act. So this could be a good or a bad thing. If you're working on something, percolating is really good because, you know, a good coffee has to brew and a cup of tea has to steep. You know, you dunk the bag around in there. But if you keep on brewing or you keep on dunking that tea bag, eventually it, the best flavor is gone and it's just not good. And so there's like, this point where percolating on an idea might actually turn into inaction and you just keep on brewing, mm, that's, that's when it's not healthy. When it is healthy, though, is when you are able to launch into the next phase, which is pulling together all those ideas that have been brewing in your mind. So if you're somebody who likes to just think about doing it, if I just thought about writing, I would never get any writing done. So eventually, we have to um, get something done and tell ourselves that we didn't, you know, like, I'm thinking about coffee yet. <laughs> really thinking about coffee right now. Um, when we brew coffee, we like the smell. And some people don't even like to drink coffee. They just want to smell coffee. It's kind of like that with our projects. We want to tell people I'm writing a book. We want to tell people, oh, someday I'm going to start my own business. And it's brewing, it's brewing, and we're not taking any action steps. So I encourage you, if you're a percolator, to take some action steps and get something done. Okay, we're at the last one. I know this is getting really long. Um, number seven, you're putting out fires all day because of what seems urgent, but you can't get to what is important. Oh, this is so common. It's common at home. It's common in business. And here's a scenario. You, let's say you have this big project you need to do today. And you sit down at eight o'clock in the morning and you're thinking, I'm going to get this project done. No problem. I have blocked out my whole day for it. But I'm going to sneak a quick peek at email to just make sure there's nothing I have to do before I get started on the project. So you read your email and suddenly there's this thing that somebody, a, a client or a friend or somebody needs something from you. And you're like, okay, I'm just going to take care of that. And an hour later, you've looked up all the things they need to do and you've sent off this email reply and you think, okay, now I'm going to sit down and I'm ready to go. And now you get a phone call and you answer the phone and it's somebody who needs something from you. And in the back of your mind, you know the only reason they need something from you right now is because they put off doing what they needed to do and now they want you to rescue them. But you think I'm a pretty nice person, so I'm gonna go ahead and do what I need to do to be a nice person and rescue them. And then when you finally finish helping them out, you think, oh my goodness, it's lunchtime already. I might as well have my lunch. And while I'm eating my lunch, I know it's making me tired just telling you this. This is how life goes, right? So you're you're thinking, well, on my phone, I'm just gonna go on social media for a few minutes while I eat my sandwich and drink my Diet Pepsi. And then pretty soon an hour and a half has gone by and your day is like half gone already and you haven't done the project. And then every day is another one like that. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, there are so many people that talk about this. There is, James Clear talks about it. Michael Hyatt talks about it. Um, Brian Tracy talks about it in Eat That Frog, where he talks about getting rid of the biggest thing first. Sometimes I have to not look at my email in the morning, turn on, turn my phone on silent and or put it in the other room and not look at text messages, not look at the phone, not answer the phone. That's what I have voicemail for. Sometimes I have to do that and let other people solve their problems because sometimes they figure it out without my help. And there's really no harm in later in the day checking my email and then saying, oh, I missed your email this morning. I'm sorry I was working. Do you still need help with this? 
you would be surprised at how often they don't need your help anymore. Okay, so we have to prioritize what's urgent and what can wait. And there are times when the biggest thing that we're supposed to get done is the urgent thing, but we make it the low priority thing because of all these little things that keep popping up that feel urgent. So I'm going to leave you some resources on the blog so that my podcast doesn't get too long, but I'm going to give you some quotes on there from James Clear who talks about understanding how to reward ourselves so that we see the long-term benefits of getting something done now, even though the real benefit comes later. We have to convince our present self, he says, to understand the value that our future self will see in what we're doing right now. And so he has some little tricks and tips for how he gets his mind to um, to make a connection between the benefits of getting it done now, even if it's a long-term outcome. So that will be on the blog, and that will be at michellerayburn.com slash 10. I'll also have some quotes from a Psychology Today article for you. So that's all I'm going to say about procrastination, except that if you need to take some steps to get some things done, I encourage you to do that because you are going to love yourself when you start to reach your goals and get some stuff done. For our life repurpose section today, this is going to be a really short section because I know we've gone a little bit long on the rest of the podcast, but I want to give you a really practical example of how procrastination works. I'm sharing this not for an organizing tip, but just as an example of how silly it can be when we put something off that wouldn't take very long to do. So I have all of my bottles of seasonings and spices and stuff like this in a drawer in my kitchen. And so I have lots of bottles. Most of them have like a red or a blue lid on them. And they're all in a drawer that I can pull out and grab when I'm cooking. Well, what would happen was I'd pull that drawer out and I would have to keep picking up bottles and looking at the labels to see what was in them. And I kept telling myself, one of these days I'm going to organize my spice drawer so that I can find everything. And it would, like for years, like I want to say at least two years, I kept saying, one of these days I'm going to organize every time I cook, which is not every day, just for the record. Um, Some days we fend for ourselves. (laughs) at my house, just to be honest. Okay, so as I'm cooking one day, I'm like, okay, this is it. I've had enough. I realize that I've talked about this for a long enough time, and the amount of time I've spent looking in my drawer to find things is crazy. I've wasted so much time. And I've talked about one of these days as if it's something that I needed like a whole weekend to do. It's one drawer in my kitchen. So I got out a Sharpie, and I wrote on the top of all the bottles, what's in them, what the seasoning is, that's all. Now, I wanna say that took me 20 minutes to a half hour, maybe an hour tops. I'm not even sure how much time it took. I just know that I spent way more time talking about what I needed to get done than it ever took to get it done. And the reason I'm sharing this with you as a practical tip is because Some of you have things that are like that. You've talked about getting it done and it might not even be that big of a project and it's just time for you to get it done. I know you can. And for some of you, it has like more significance than organizing a spice drawer. I know that one's silly, but for some of us, it's something that is actually even a spiritual priority. It has something to do with our relationship with God. Like we're putting off like reading the Bible daily, or we're putting off getting back into going to church, or we're putting off making a change in our life that we know would help us to grow spiritually. But we're, we're thinking, well, I have someday. I'll do it someday. And you know, if I get a life-threatening illness, then, then I'll want, no, no, no. Don't wait for that. I'm encouraging you to figure out what is important and focus your priorities there. Because just like with any other project in your life, life is short and how we use our time on earth matters. And so if that's the one difference you can make in your life is that you make a decision that has some sort of long-term eternal value, then I've encouraged you all I need to encourage you for today. So that is our life repurpose tip coming up next. I'm going to have a couple of tips and then I'm going to sign off after I give you some resources.
Okay, for our books and resources this week, I could give you thousands of things. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you about three and I'm not gonna give them to you in a lot of detail. I'm going to encourage you to go to the blog, which I call my show notes at michellerayburn.com slash 10. And there you're gonna get links and a lot more detail. But I've talked about James Clear, who has a blog, and um, I posted recently about his book, Atomic Habits. In the sidebar on my blog page, I have a lot more resources that are not even included in the twice a month podcast and video blog. There's just a lot of stuff that I can't put all in these, and so I have more there. And so I mentioned that book and some of the ideas that I've gotten from it. Um, Really, James Clear talks about how procrastination and habits are so tied together. And in Atomic Habits, he talks about, um, like I said, um, capturing the, uh, the benefit and the value that we get from future uh, outcomes, we capture that now. And he talks about how habits are tied to that. So like, here's a quick example. Let's say you're procrastinating exercising, but you love watching a TV series. And this is something I've incorporated in my own life. I pick certain shows on Netflix that I only watch when I'm on my elliptical so that I look forward to getting on the elliptical because I get to watch another episode of the show. So I've linked something that I would rather procrastinate, exercise, and I've linked it with TV, which is something I like. So I put my iPad up there and I watch an episode. So um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, I'm gonna list that on there. Another one is the one that a couple of people have mentioned to me on Facebook when I asked, what are your favorite resources? Um, Eat That Frog, 21 Great Ways to Stop procrastinating, Procrastinating and Get More Done in Less Time by Brian Tracy. This one has been out for a long time and he's actually on the third edition of the book. But Brian talks about eating your ugliest, ugliest frog first. And that means tackling the hardest thing on your to do list or the thing that's hanging over your head and get it done. And he says sometimes you have to ignore how you feel and just get started. So this is a good, this book is a good place to start if you don't know uh, where to get started first. And then the last one that I wanna recommend for today is Work Simply. This is by Carson Tate. And um, this is one I read a couple years ago and I definitely wanna read it again. She actually talks about productivity style. And I think it's actually helpful in knowing your productivity style before you start to tackle projects because how you work and how you are rewarded and get feedback and all that is really um, different. And so knowing yourself is helpful. I wanna close with a quote from Carson Tate from her website. And I think it's relevant to me and it's probably relevant to someone who's listening. Carson says, when you check your inbox too much, it's a form of productive procrastination. You do it because you're avoiding accomplishing items on your task list. Checking your inbox makes you feel good. Each time you get a new email, it's like you're getting something new and exciting. It gives you the illusion of accomplishing work, but the reality is you're not. Your emails are inhibiting you from being truly productive. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, lots of resources, the longest podcast I've ever done. It's over 30 minutes, but thank you for sticking with me. I'm definitely gonna be posting more about this on social media, and so I encourage you to connect with me. Facebook, I have an author page. Twitter, that's another place where I'll be sharing some links to additional articles and things that I think you might be interested in. Instagram, just some fun and quick posts that I'll share. Um, but without a lot of um, heavy content, but just a fun place to connect. And then also LinkedIn. Professionally, I'd love to hear from other people who are really working on their business goals and working on their writing goals. Tell me that you saw me on the podcast or connected with me on the blog because it helps me to just know how we uh, found out about each other and I will follow you back. So um, that is Life Repurposed, episode 10 on procrastination. Please join me next time for a topic not yet discovered or announced. You've been listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn. Check out tips, resources, and inspiration at michellerayburn.com.